We turn our focus to the value of the rural vote and which farmers are best positioned to hold the keys to the White House. Alan Birga with the National Milk Producers Federation now joins us with the latest. Alan, as always, thanks for taking the time to join us today. Uh, so what are some of the agricultural highlights that you're seeing when you look at the electoral map? Well, it's interesting when you take a look at uh, the key battlegrounds of the 2020 election. You know, you're going to hear in the next few months a lot of discussion about the farm vote and the importance of farmers for constituencies. But we delved a little bit further at National Milk at, at what farmers are we really talking about. And when you take a look at where certain types of farmers are located in what key states, dairy actually ends up having an awful lot of clout. Now, part of this goes back to how American agriculture developed. Um, a lot of commodities where there are railroad networks that could transfer transport crops and even livestock across the plains, they were able to be in less populated areas. Dairy grew up closer to urban areas because it was a daily perishable product. And because of that, states where there are really close rural, rural urban divides, that's where you find the dairy farmers and their votes are going to be very important come 2020. It certainly does make sense. So how important is the swing states as far as the dairy sector is concerned? Well, that's something that you take a look at, and it really is interesting. Um, you take a look at the top, ta top eight dairy states, and then you take a look at the top eight states that were closest in the election. There's an overlap there. Uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, those were the three states that flipped toward President Trump and gave him the White House. Those are three of the top eight dairy states. And then another of the closer states, Minnesota, which stayed with Hillary Clinton but almost gave its electoral vote to President Trump. Um, they are are also a top dairy state as well. So when candidates are campaigning and taking a look at their messages and they're thinking about farm voters, when they put that farm voter in their head, they might want to be thinking about somebody who's milking a cow. So, Alan, farm labor and dairy labeling, those are both key issues that we've talked about a lot in this process. What would you like to see now moving forward? Well, you know, there is going to be uh, an effort in the Senate now on agricultural labor reform. The uh, U.S. House last winter, of course, in December, passed an ag labor package, the first one to get through the House on a bipartisan basis since 1986. Now there's going to start to be a Senate effort. Um, the National Milk Producers Federation supported that bill, trying to make sure that some of the concerns there were about that bill get fixed in the Senate version. But you need a Senate bill for something to become law. This seems like a lift that could be done even in election year. Year, but the closer you get to the election, the less Congress acts. So the time to act really is now. Ellen, all of this info, I understand, is part of the Dairy Defined series that you guys have. Can you give us, give us kind of a rundown of this initiative and how we can subscribe? Yeah, Dairy Defined is the National Milk Producers Federation effort on thought leadership on issues that have a broad audience within and outside agriculture. It's an attempt to marshal the facts, which we believe are on our side, to be on our side. We do a podcast every two weeks that alternates with a written piece. This piece that we just did on the election, um, you can see on our website right now at www.nmpf.org. Or if you write info at nmpf.org and just ask to, describe to subscribe to Dairy Defined, you can get it every week in your inbox. As always, very good insight. Thank you very much, Alan Birga, with the National Milk Producers Federation, joining us from our Washington, D.C. news studio.